please allow me to welcome all of you, including our two distinguished speakers here at the Institute of International Relations on this very uh, special occasion. But before introducing the speakers um, and giving the floor to them for their opening remarks, um, let me just remind you that you are all cordially invited to the um, brief presentation of the Institute's new uh, Center for European Security uh, by the coordinator of the Center, Benjamin Tallis, that will uh, follow uh, after a short break, after the end of the seminar, and you are also invited for a glass of wine, which I'm sure all of you will appreciate. Um, in fact, also uh, this, this very seminar is, is conceived as a formal launch of the Center for European Security, even though the Center has been in operation for quite some months already, um, uh, since January 2015. Um, and that is also why the topic of uh, today's presentation or discussion uh, embodies the uh, raison d'etre of, of the center uh, that is uh, analyzing the changing landscape of European, uh, European security, both in academic terms and in terms of, of public uh, policies. Uh, now, we all know that the EU um, at the moment faces the most dangerous and uncertain security situation probably uh, since its very uh, uh, conception um, uh, both in the eastern direction and in the south it is surrounded by a number of uh, crises, uh, military conflicts, uh, socio-economic uh, problems uh, and the case, several cases of even failing states uh, in all of which the EU is either directly or indirectly implicated. Um, and of course, after the annexation of the uh, Crimean Peninsula by, by Russia, um, uh, the very legal foundations of the European security is uh, cast, um, uh, is called into question. Um, and of course, we have to take into account also the EU's own uh, self-confidence, uh, which has been substantially shaken by the uh, socio-economic uh, crisis, uh, Europe, the uh, um, atmosphere is ripe with, it, with discussions about democratic deficit and the uh, EU's international credibility again after some time. Um, the EU used to think of itself as a uh, normative power, to use Jan Manners' term, uh, and it used to have uh, ambitions to, to shape uh, the, global, uh, the global space to provide some uh, global public goods, to be a force for good uh, in the global arena. Uh, but against this background of uh, increasingly uh, competitive relations among uh, great powers, um, uh, this uh, you know, projection of the EU's normative power is, is becoming very difficult, if not outright impossible. Uh, so in short, the EU faces a number of complex challenges. Uh, both internally and externally. And um, uh, these discussions about the uh, security in Europe, of Europe, and in the EU in particular, is, is uh, very timely. Uh, more to that, it is even more timely because uh, we are now just ahead of the, of the summit of EU leaders in, in June, uh, where the decision about the, the shape and substance of the new European security strategy uh, shall be taken. Uh, I would like to stress here that the Center for European Security has been uh, involved in these discussions about the new European security strategy, preparing a seminar for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense of the Czech Republic, and so in this sense, this seminar can be seen as part of this of this broader of this broader process. Uh, luckily for us, we have uh, two of the most distinguished. Uh, scholars and thinkers uh, who can tell us a lot about the uh, current shape and perhaps the future as well of uh, the European security order. Let me introduce them very briefly, starting in the alphabetical order with uh, Peter Burgess, who is uh, an acclaimed scholar of uh, international security, a, a cultural historian, a political scientist, research professor at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, um, and also, last but not least, editor of uh, one of the most famous journals in the field, Security Dialogue. 
Um, Ivan Krastev is a famous public intellectual whose presence is felt not only in Bulgaria and in, Euro in Europe, but beyond. Uh, chairman of the Center for uh, Liberal Strategies. We have just discussed this uh, easy to remember name uh, in Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, and also a permanent fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. Uh, the structure of the seminar will be very simple. I'll first uh, give the floor to both of the speakers for about 20 minutes talk. And then, of course, we'll open uh, the space for you as well for your questions and comments. Uh, so, Peter, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here. Not only it's my first time in Prague, but it's a very lovely occasion to, to mark uh, the association of this event with the Center for European Security, and not least for the rebirth of uh, new perspectives, both uh, largely the fruit, fruit of the genius of uh, Benjamin Tallis and his uh, collaborators. Uh, thanks also to the staff of the Institute who have been very, very helpful with a very complicated schedule <laughs> this morning and this afternoon. Um, that being said, and my gratitude for this hospitality, I now am going to directly abuse the, that hospitality by um, asking some, some difficult questions about the very concept that we're here to talk about and the title of the seminar, namely uh, the future of European security. So I want to use my time to constructively, I hope, ask some questions about what security is and what it can mean in this context, context what the future of it can be, and then also to put it in, uh, in um, alignment with two core documents, one of which is named in the, in the uh, brochure announcing this event, namely Solana's A Secure Europe from 2003, and then more recently, indeed, published last week, the European Agenda on Security. So those being, in some sense, two endpoints of an evolution in the idea of security, which touches us all and touches us, touches the way that we understand the threats that Peter just, just named. So to start, the future of security. Well, the future of security is a strange thing to say, I think, because, because security is always about the future. <coughs> There's no security which is happening in the present. There's insecurity which happens in the present, but it's about the future. Security is a, always about what might happen, that we don't know what's going to happen. If we knew what was, what was going to happen, it wouldn't be a problem of security. We'd know what to do, and we'd dissolve or eliminate the problem. So security, security threats, to be more concrete, always come at us from the future, sometimes careening faster than we can hope for, sometimes encroaching slowly, but always coming out of a future which is never completely known. Insecurity is about prepare, preparing for something that's unknown, an unknown future. It's about planning action, political action, policy action, with an incomplete deck of cards, with incomplete knowledge about the future. It's never about what dangers are simply present. It's never completely about that. It's partly about that. It's linked to that. It's linked to present problems. But it's always about something which is a matter of speculation, which is a matter of looking at a crystal ball, which is a matter of hope, and which is a matter of heavy responsibility in the sense that we're, we're taking action based on a number of unknowns. Right? So insecurity or security studies, security policy, always takes the form of a question. It's never the form of an answer. It's a question of what is going to happen. So we're always speculating about the future of security. Security is always about the future. To sort of reconstruct this situation, because I think it's really always been that way, but it's evolved quite considerably, we could take a perspective which reaches back to the Cold War, a sort of Cold War concept of security, and up into to one which is beyond the Cold War, speaking very, very simply, simplifying greatly here, we can say to a certain degree that the Cold War had a certain monopoly on the concept of security. Any time between 1950 and 1980, if you breathe the word security, the referent was relatively clear. 
Uh, it was about a bipolar opposition. It was about the nation state. It was, it was about the Iron Curtain. It was about stakes of this kind. It wasn't possible to think of something else, or not much else, when the word security was used during this period. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, simplifying again, for apologies, I have my 20 minutes, you know. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have a kind of inflation in the concept of security, almost an explosion. In vertical terms, we have local security, we have regional, group, national, over-regional, up to global. All sorts of different levels of security that, are, that, that become politicized, become objects of, of policy discussion. We have horizontal expansion of the notion of security, from financial to sec security, to gender security, to health, to food, to uh, information technology security, an explosion in themes and, and subsets of security. Suddenly, security is about many, many things. But what we notice in all of this is that the new correlates of the notion of security after the Cold War are about how the way we're going to deal, how we're going to deal with the unknown. So security is far less about what the clear and present danger out there is going to do, and it's far more about how we are going to react to the unknown future. How society should organize itself, how we should prepare ourselves to be resilient. The, the term resilience has risen in this context. The term risk, risk management, has come nearly to replace security in many circles. How do we live today with the risk that something might happen, but we don't know what? instead of a clear and present danger during the Cold War, which we were much more equipped to clearly um, deal with. Now, if we turn to the present day, and we think about the one example that Peter mentioned, the immigration crisis um, that's, that's ongoing, which is just uh, stupendous, which is uh, beyond imaginable proportions, um, we see that that these people are not a threat. Migrants rowing across the Mediterranean in hole-filled boats and rafts, they're not a threat to Europe, but they're called a threat, aren't they? They're conceptualized as threats. As threats. But what, what is really going on there, in my view, is that it's throwing into question Europe. The threat is the identity crisis of Europe. How are we going to react? Who are we? To what degree is Europe, Europe, under this, the pressure of this immigration? So the threat, if we want to talk about a threat, is not from outside. It's from inside in a strange way. Are we ourselves, can we be that humanitarian force, that normative force that we understand ourselves to be or want to understand ourselves to be? Are we, are we going to be the right space society are we going to be open, liberal, free, all these things? Is that what, really what we are? What's under threat is European identity. It's not the border lines of Europe which are threatened by the immigrants. It's identity. The, the question of uh, a belligerent Russia, I might leave to more knowledgeable experts. It's a different kind of logic, but related nonetheless. So security really is about making choices about who we are, and particularly I'm thinking of the immigration case. Now to underscore this change in logic, let's look at the two documents I just mentioned and see what's going on there. The, first of all, this, A Secure Europe from 2003, Javier Solana's um, framework uh, document. If you reread the document, which, which is really instructive, it's quite interesting to, to look back. It seems like a short time, but if you read it, it's a whole different world. It's a different world altogether. Security is cast as a problem of globalization, globalized <coughs> threats. There's a sense of danger which is ambient, which is ubiquitous. This is in the introductory pages of the document you see. Threat to Europe is linked to things out there. The world out there is more complex. We don't understand it. We don't have a good overview. We can't control it. It's unforeseeable in the, in the way I was uh, describing before. Uh, but it's out there. It's out there. And so the key threats that are listed, there are five. They're terrorism. We're on the 
right after uh, 9-11, right, in 2003. Weapons of mass destruction, regional conflicts, state failure, and organized crime. Of these, how many have survived the 12 years that intervened? Two, organized crime and, and terrorism, by and large. As to the sort of guiding themes that structure the, the document, they're all insights about Europe's borders. Talking about what's out there threatening us and what's in here to be preserved. There's language of the first line of defense straight out of the Vietnam strategy uh, code book. There's talk about um, territory, what's beyond the European territory, how we can hold the European territory, what the territorial borders of Europe mark, what they should preserve, what they should keep away. The newly formed neighborhood programs are very evident here because these were ways of managing the European region. They still are to a certain degree, but they were conceived as ways of managing the European neighborhood because that's where problems will likely arise. There's talk of a new international order, a post-Cold War order, uh, a new Central and Eastern Europe, all out there. There's an emphasis on international organizations and regional organizations. So those organizations which are going to help us to manage what's going on out there. And there's the first talk of uh, a rapid response force. Remember that? From way back when. That's uh, one for nostalgia. Uh, for challenges outside the borders. Okay. You, you're getting the picture I'm painting. A little bit characterized, forgive me. Uh, if we turn uh, forward the clock then to 2015, to the document published just last week um, in a communica communication from the European Commission called the European Agenda on Security, which very much is correlated with the Juncker Platform document, um, A New Start for Europe, it's called. So they're, they're very good to read together. Um, here we hear nothing uh, that's not linked to internal security versus external security, with the emphasis on internal security. So you see where I'm going with this already, from a logic of prophylactic security, keeping bad things out, to a logic of managing internal security in the present document. Um, so the entire internal security, based on this notion of um, uh, the basic principles of, of the liberal market, free movement of goods, services, and capital, which are threatened by certain things. So the internal movement of things, uh, of, of the economic system is threatened by the new security situation. The security, the conditions for trade in Europe are under pressure or under threat. Security is recast as a subset of the European market liberal project in this document. And the tools at our disposition are not foreign policy mechanisms. They are judicial control, rules, regulations, directives, management, uh, policing, internal policing, or, but policing which is aimed at keeping stability, predictability, and uh, done without, within an acceptable margin. The key threats now are three down from five, terrorism and with the uh, underscored radicalization. Radicalization of who? Of Europeans. Who are the most prominent terrorists of the last half a decade? Europeans, not foreigners. Foreign trained Europeans uh, often, but nonetheless Europeans. So radicalization is an anti-terror mechanism which is aimed at Europeans who are not radicalized, that is, they respect the regulations and norms and laws of a liberal society, but become, become per perverted. Cross-border crime is the second one, which, which is preserved from the 2003 document. And then finally, cybercrime, the great transnational uh, new threat, which I think many would agree is, is the, the prominent threat today. The, guide, the guiding themes of this document uh, are internal, rights-based, um, normative. So fundamental rights, 
transparency, accountability, and democratic control of institutions, implementation of legal instruments, interagency and cross-sectoral approaches, and finally, unifying of internal and external security measures and, 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 and mechanisms. So managing what we've got here inside the European, the borders of Europe, if you like, take precedence over managing or dealing with what's outside. The operational tools that are put to use are uh, managerial as well, and very focused on information. The new security tools of our time are informational. So we can talk about Schengen information system, uh, we can talk about the PRUM framework, which is a police um, data uh, sharing uh, arrangement. We can talk about the PNR, the passenger name records, the European Criminal Records Information System, the Maritime Common Information Sharing Environment. All of these are information sharing mechanisms based on the conviction that maintaining security within Europe is about coordinating information about Europeans. Uh, there's also interagency co collaboration for crisis management. There's a lot of emphasis on customs. There's a lot of emphasis on joint police work, joint investigation, and judicial cooperation. So liberalizing, uh, standardizing the European mechanisms internally. So the compar comparison of the two documents is really quite bleak really quite strong and, and radical. And what, I, what it feels like we see, particularly relative to the migration uh, discussion, I was sitting last night preparing this and, and thinking about Interstellar, this um, the Christopher Nolan mm -hmm. film, mm -hmm. and thought that we have um, a collapse of the European security architecture in a kind of black hole where there's a kind of time shift, there's a space shift from the outside to the inside, and there's a time shift from the present to the past. Because I think what Europeans fear is the greatest threat against Europe uh, is the European past. A, some, some kind of rebirth of the catastrophic past of, I'm talking about the thousand years past, but, but starting with the, the experience of the Second World War, that somehow this will come back. And this is what we see in the migration crisis. Are we treating migrants like Europeans or are we treating them like excluded minorities, future excluded minorities? Is the migration crisis an indication that we haven't gotten over our dark uh, European, European, European past? Is there, um, is there a danger that we, we relive this past? that we start treating each other like we treated each other in the recent or distant past, that we relive that past. Or even worse, that we relive, we relive it even knowing that we're reliving it. So people are still alive who experience the Second World War and then see the way that Europeans are discussing it at ad nauseum, the migration crisis. So somehow there's something about this time shift I, told, I said in the beginning that security is about the future. It's about the future becoming the past in this sense. Or I wonder, it's a, it's a, it's a question. And then I was reminded of this um, vignette from Walter Benjamin. Mm -hmm. You probably know it, from the, um, the thesis on the philosophy of history from 1920 about the Angelus Novum, mm -hmm. the CLI. Here I'll read you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me just cite it for you if you don't mind. Benjamin writes, a key painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. So he's moving backwards. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned towards the past where we perceive a, change of, a chain of events. He sees one single cat catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It's got caught in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm 
irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. So the angel of history is looking at the past, wishing he could go back. But the winds of progress, the storm of progress, are blowing him backwards into his angelic wings, backwards so he can't even look into the future to see where he's going. This is security uh, in Europe. This is the security situation. Wanting to redeem ourselves, wanting to be some image of an original, pure, good, right space, liberal uh, from our past and worried that we're not going ever to be able to make it uh, back to it. This is the kind of this idea that we have redemption, that we can redeem ourselves for the Second World War, for the Crusades, for the thousand year history of, 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 of dark uh, events, that we could keep them uh, away. But somehow we have to live with them. And that's really the, the moral crisis of the security situation uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter. I'm uh, really fascinating by the presentation. I have my questions regarding your presentation, but I'll leave them for afterwards. I just want to make a brief remark because Angelus Nobis is my favorite picture <laughs> by Bon Claire, so I'm really happy that you've mentioned the picture, even though it's rather apocalyptic, I have to say. Uh, Ivan, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be here. And it was a beautiful uh, presentation. What Benjamin is talking about the future is, by the way, the way the Chinese perceive the space. In the Chinese idea of space, past is in front of you, and the future is behind your back, because the past is what we see. So the idea where is basically the future and where is the past is just opposite to us. I'm saying this because what I'll try to do is uh, uh, very much try to talk uh, about this post-Cold War European order, why we have the feeling it's the major crisis, and especially why basically the situation in Ukraine created a crisis in our perceptions of European security. I'm not going to talk about what's happening on the ground here or there. Uh, so Robert Cooper, who was one of the major writers of the Solana Security Doctrine in 2003, and if you remember, this doctrine starts with a sentence which basically sounds like never in its history Europeans have been freer, wealthier, and more secure. Mm -hmm. This same person in 1989 was the head of the foreign policy planning of the British uh, Foreign Ministry. So the situation was changing so quickly, so he created a very special stamp. And the stamp was with three uh, letters, O-B-E, overtaken by events. So he basically asked all the files of the foreign ministry to go, and they were putting OBE on some of the major files because they were not perceived relevant. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because if you're reading this type of uh, first sentence, you're going to see that we know one thing about European new security doctrine of 2015. It will not start with a sentence like this. Europeans don't feel so much secure in economic terms. According uh, to the last uh, uh, Eurobarometer, more than 60% of Europeans believe that their, ki their children are going to have a life worse than their own. So it's a major change of perception. Of course, Europeans uh, have also some questions how free they are, because on one level, of course, we have a lot of rights, but on the other level, you have the specter of the surveillance states coming there. And also, you have this strange story in which you have more rights, but you don't have the feeling that you have more power. And this explains the fact that in the seven last years, you see so many people on the streets of democratic countries. And also, when it basically uh, comes to security, I very much agree, security is in front of us. What we are now starting to live is with insecurity. Where the Ukraine crisis come in all this? Because here is the problem of the Ukrainian crisis. On one level, it has the feeling that it changed everything. On the other, in fact, it changed nothing. It even didn't change the military budgets of the German and the United Kingdom. After all this talk about how insecure we'll go, basically, for the next year, the Germany decided to reduce their military spending, and the United Kingdom too. 
So why, what is the essence of the crisis? And in order to understand the essence of the crisis, I do believe it's very important to go back and to try to understand what exactly shocked us so much. And here I'm going to claim that it was not Russia's decision to keep control over Crimea, but it was basically the Russian decision to annex Crimea that came as such a big surprise for the European policy community. Because this is one thing to know, not to know what the future has for us. It's totally different not to know what the other actors are not going to do. You never can be sure what others will do, but you have always the illusion that you know what the others would not do. And this is why I do believe comes at the heart of the security crisis we're talking about. This is a crisis of some of our basic assumptions how the world is functioning. And here I will try to make uh, also a very simplified and uh, kind of simple story. When we're talking about European order and post-Cold War European order, one of the important things is that everybody knows that basis and principles on which this order is based are different than the basis and principles on, for example, uh, international order as a whole is based. We had the feeling as Europeans that after 1989, we put not simply the end of the Cold War, but what uh, the same Cooper said, this is the end of the three hungry tiers of European foreign policy based on spheres of influence and military rivalries. The feeling was that what we have created was basically created only in Europe, but we very much believe that this is the model of the world to come. So now it's here, but we're going to expand. Uh, there is a great Greek diplomat who made a comparison which I like a lot, who said, listen, do you know what's the difference between the United States and European Union? He said, US are missionaries. They're going to the world and trying to convert people. We're like a monastery. We say, come to us. But the idea that European Union is going to basically develop through European enlargement, but also through diffusing its principles and norms, was very much there. The idea was about ring of friends. And we believe that we know why this is happening. And the major assumptions was that economic interdependence means more security. What blew up, not on practical level, not on the territory of Ukraine, but in the minds of the European politicians is that the Ukrainian crisis came as a very strong argument that economic interdependence can mean security, but also they, they can bring to the situation in which when you have a crisis, it's much more difficult for you to react. In a certain way, all the philosophy of the European security policies have been, we're starting to trade, we're starting to go with the different projects with our neighbors, and of course Russia was very important because of its size, because of its past and others, and as a result of it, you're basically trying to reduce uh, 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 the risk uh, of having military uh, uh, military clash. The problem is that if you're so much interdependent, if the military conflict is going to erupt, it appears that it's very difficult for you to react. And this other side, the dark side of interdependence, came to the politicians, in my view, and to the policymakers in a very strong way. If you now basically see what we're talking these days, this is basically reducing interdependence. Now everybody is, is dreaming for asymmetrical interdependence. We should be interdependent, but better that you're going to be more dependent on me than I'm going to be on you. And this is very important because this is changing all the story. For example, before, the fact that we are buying Russian gas and Russian oil was perceived as one of the major sources of security in Europe. Now the fact that you're buying Russian gas and Russian oil is perceived as one of the major sources of insecurity in Europe. The second thing that basically was very much at the heart, and this is very strongly in the doctrine, was all this idea of uh, that security is based on legal institutions. It's not simply rules, but it is institutions. For us, institution, what our basic understanding of how security functions. And then basically, you see a model in which it's not so much the institutions, it's the idea of strategic leadership that comes up. Somebody uh, rightly said that probably Russia is not strong, but it's strong-willed in this conflict. And then the problem of the leadership as a kind of an alternative 
uh, for strategic behavior is also coming to the European Union and asking the simple questions. It very, is it possible for the European Union to be a strategic actor in a situation in which we're so much risk averse and everybody is about institution building in a situation which probably uh, demands certain type of leadership? And also when we talk about insecurity, we can agree that insecurity has been growing all over the European Union, but the truth is that the sources of insecurity are very different. You don't know many Italians who are st strongly troubled about what's happening in Ukraine, because basically their insecurity is much more created, is connected by the way what is happening on the southern part of Europe. It's very much about Libya, immigration, even in France, there are going to be much more people talking about radical Islam. On the other side, if you go to Poland and to the Balkan countries, you're not going to see a lot of talk about radical Islam. So how are we are going to reconcile even the threat perceptions on the level of the European Union? We feel insecure, but in a certain way, we have a competing uh, sources and vision where insecurity comes from. Uh, and I'm saying this because I do believe one of the interesting stories, and this is probably one of the reasons why it was <coughs> difficult for us to understand and to try to conceptualize this situation. And I very much agree that now we're starting to talk about insecurity as an internal problem. That we're starting to understand that the biggest problem for the European Union in security terms is the disintegration of the Union itself. When we're talking these days about, for example, the Russia challenge, Russia challenge is not classical military challenge of the Russian tank is going to Warsaw, probably some people also expect this, but this is very much about paralyzation, dysfunctionality of the European Union, basically disintegration of the European Union itself, which is coming as the major threat for the citizens and states that have been betted on the European Union as a major security instrument. NATO, another problem, basically, you have the feeling of the divergence security perceptions and interests on the side of the United States and Europe in general, basically based on different strategic paradigms. And for me, this is the major problem which uh, I see with the, the new kind of a situation and also the problem of this new document that it should uh, uh, solve. First, you're looking inside, by the way, foreign policy, the relations between foreign policy and democratic politics is changing a lot. If you see as the Cold War, uh, situation you're going to see that in a certain way security and foreign policy was taken out of electoral process in Western Europe. Uh, uh, Chancellor Schmidt has this famous saying, our relations with the United States are too important to be left to the voters. What was at the heart of the political life and electoral politics was economic relations. What was outside was very much foreign and security politics in the terms of bipolar world. Now we see a slightly different type of dynamics. In the last years, European Union is trying to take certain type of economic decisions outside of the electoral politics. We are constitutionalizing budget deficits and other type of stories, but as a result of it, what is getting in is very much more identity politics and as a result of it, much more foreign policy. This is a different political dynamic. In a certain way, it's not simply that the problems are different, but strangely enough, the people who are going to decide are different. Uh, and from this point of view, for me, uh, the biggest problem is, and uh, 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 on the basis of this, I'll try to go to my conclusion, the biggest challenge to the European policymakers is not simply this or that action, not simply the money that should be invested here and there, even not the military dimension of the conflict, but we believe that we have European order, which in one way is universal in its nature. And now we're discovering that it is exceptional. And we don't know what to do with this discovery. Either to protect it, and what does it mean? By the way, what does it mean in policy terms? Our relations with Russia, our relations with Turkey, our relations with the United States. Or should we insist still that we have a kind of a normative order which is going to spread so I'm going to end up with a, a metaphor which we have been using with a colleague of mine in a piece we just published. This is something that happened to the Japanese technology companies. Uh, in Japan, uh, uh, it is called Galapagos Syndrome. Uh, the 3G uh, communication technology in Japan, according to everybody, is famous to be the most technologically advanced. But they were so advanced that they cannot be exported. Nobody else used them outside of Japan. And I do believe that this is the problem with the 
European perception of security. Probably our kind of a view of security order was the most <coughs> promoted, the most advanced, the most interesting. The problem is that we discovered that it is not shared by the world. And from this point of view, yeah, and from this point of view, this is quite important because even if you see basically the sanction policies with respect to Russia, you're going to see that many of the world powers, and I'm talking democratic countries like Brazil and India, uh, are not joining us, not because of anything, but because they don't share this view of a post-sovereign order that basically is so important at the center of the European understanding of order. So I'm going to stop in a certain way with this question because for me, the biggest problem which I do believe this security doctrine should address, and I'm afraid that it's going to be very difficult, in fact, to address, is exactly this. Is this, if this is a particular and exceptional European order, how we're going to secure it? Secondly, do we really believe that it is going to expand under certain conditions? And what are these conditions? And from this point of view, uh, uh, basically, what kind of policies can go with this? So I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, very much. Um, I particularly appreciate the uh, discussion about the relation which, which was present in both the presentations about uh, the double possibility of constructing European or EU identity. Uh, Cecho, Dietz, and many other scholars talk about that. Either you can have the spatial dimension, we identify, our, define ourselves against someone, against Russia, against Turkey, whatever, against the Orient, or temporal, against our own past. Mm. And now it seems that we are in a situation when we combine them both seeing the danger coming from Russia connected to the European radical right, for instance, perhaps financed by Russia. So these two dimensions now merge. Um, but um, I'll leave my questions for afterwards. First, I will open the floor for you. Any comments, any questions you would like to ask, now is the time, please. And please always identify yourself, your name, your institution. No security okay. threats. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there will be some. Daniela. Um, hello, my name is Daniela Kalaniova. I'm currently from the Anglo American University, just down the corner. Uh, I would like to ask Peter Burgess about um, actually the novelty of the strategy that, that you're talking about, because by coincidence, just today I was reviewing with my students EU anti terrorism policies, and a lot of these tools that you've identified, a lot of these um, mingling between the external internal borders. This is already present in the internal security strategies of the European Union. The counter-terrorism strategy, uh, we need to prevent, we need to uh, share information, uh, we need to harmonize and um, make our judicial and police forces more uh, cooperative. So isn't it isn't to me such a, such a great shock that this would be also uploaded onto the foreign policy, let's say the general uh, security strategy dimension. Uh, do you think that this is just like the point of coming to realize that, yes, we, we, are, we finally have to come to terms with the world being slightly different, or maybe perhaps this time we will do something about putting these, uh, I don't know, strategy, strategies into practice? Because a lot of the criticism of internal security was that Yes, we have all these very nice documents, security strategies, action plans, uh, hate program, temporary program, but when it comes to actual implementation, there hasn't been really that much put on the ground, or that they have been implemented up to 50% or 70%, but it is really the lowest common denominator uh, policies. So the question, I guess, would be, is it really that new of a strategy, and do you think that this time Europeans will actually implement most of it? Thank you. I have also a related question to that, mm -hmm. because that is a duality or dichotomy which you hinted at, but not really spelled out in full, and that is when you talked about this shift to regulation, sort of technical management, uh, which has a sort of dehumanizing aspect as well. So humans are seen only as objects of some technical, 
you know, instrumental manipulation. Mm. Is that how you perceive the shift in, in, in the new perception of security threats in Europe as well? Or, or is it something that you do not agree with? Mm. Um, yes, if you could answer. Shall I go ahead? Yes. Well, first of all, thanks for the question. I mean, it's, a, it's really more of a comment than you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's nothing, it's been an evolution. But it's, it wasn't present in 2003. It's, um, it came up at, uh, with Hague and, um, and uh, Plum, as you say, and it's been developing. But, it, but it's gained in momentum, it's gained in legitimacy, and it matches better now than ever before the threat, the self-image, the image of uh, Europe, Europe and Europeans as being under threat. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's there, it's always been there, but it, it's grown in, in force. I think there were hints from the beginning that it was linked to external security, to foreign policy, to external action. But as you say, also, it's now it's become explicitly connected to it. So external action is really a matter of managing internal security from, from a certain point of view. So well, well noted. Um, I, I don't think I would go so far as to say but uh, agree with you that it's a matter of dehumanizing in any sense. It is, should I say, informationalizing mm -hmm. people. It's saying that uh, uh, neutralizing a security threat from a European citizen uh, involves uh, collecting information about that citizen. Not exactly technological, but mm -hmm. in the same spirit as right. what you, right. you're saying. And this is a problem, and this, this also um, stands in conflict with the challenge of de-radicalization, radicalization, understanding radicalization, because it's exactly by uh, keeping the non-digital nature of human beings, their, their fears, their marginalizations, their exclusions and inclusions, keeping these alive and in play and in, in negotiation, that will help us to combat radicalization and not catalogs and uh, data points and, and right. the rest. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't be afraid. No security threats coming from our speakers. Well, yes. Ben. Thank you. I'm Benjamin Tallis from the Centre for European Security of the Institute of International Relations. I'm very happy to see so many of you here today for two wonderful talks by our speakers. Um, I have a, a couple of points perhaps to, to put. Um, loosely speaking, organized around space, time, and the social world, so nothing, nothing much. Um, in terms of, of uh, space, referring to Robert Cooper, who Ivan Krasto mentioned, um, Robert Cooper famously said, amongst ourselves we keep the law, but when we're in the jungle we must play by the laws of the jungle. A reference to the need for a variegated policy of dealing with a rights-based, rule-based system, values-based system internally, but playing by the rules of realpolitik or of geostrategy when venturing abroad. It strikes me as though this um, marked somehow the infiltration of a security agenda to what had perhaps been previously what we might term a gregarious European policy to um, very much the Mark Leonard point of view that Europe can spread and why Europe will run the 21st century and so on because these values can be exported. But this infiltration of security and the identification of a jungle creates problems particularly in the neighborhood where countries such as Ukraine come to be seen as both similar and different. They become this uncanny territory which haunts the European past and the potential European future. So I wonder how you would perhaps square Cooper's input on the secure Europe in a better world with perhaps the problems that some of us think he may have been contributing to creating uh, through that. Um, in terms of time, the role of the, the European past both as a motivator and as an inhibitor for the European Union and European identity as we see it uh, Tony Judd famously said that the, the EU's future is mortgaged to Europe's past and to the continued memory of Europe's past. And indeed, this threat of collapsed back into the dark times, into the thousand years of bad European history, is one of the prime motivators for the existence of the European Union and for maintaining a certain values-based politics rather than retreat to strategic interest, etc. However, we've seen just in the last week in Czech Republic the European values think tank, Evropské um, Hodnoty, publishing a piece um, claiming that the need to preserve Europe and the need to preserve the European Union and prevent this fall back into the past must lead it to reject a Europeanization of migration policy, must lead it to reject actually acting in accordance with European values uh, when dealing with migrants on our shores. 
So we can see this dual role of the pastors. It's a threat we must be cognizant of, but is it a motivator to a continued European values-based identity, or is it actually an inhibitor to this in some way? Um, very finally, this uh, notion of identity is indeed absolutely crucial to, to the question of security in Europe and indeed elsewhere. It seems that I mentioned this idea of gregariousness before, and it seems that rather than this internal-external divide, which has been problematized by many, this blurring of the worlds of policing of military, of foreign and domestic policy, what we see is more a move to introspection, and this crisis of confidence plus crisis of identity brought by internal European events, the economic crisis, um, but a potential insecurity about our own ways and means and whether they actually work, the failure to achieve goals in the neighborhood. Um, it seems as though we are, we are struggling severely with a crisis of confidence, and I wonder what our speakers think it would take to actually re-motivate a European security policy and indeed a European Union that can be confident in its own values. Thank you. Start. Let's start with Cooper, because it's uh, absolutely critical point. So it's the end of 1990s. Cooper is writing this book on the breaking of nations, classical idea of liberal imperialism, which is based on something that is more than simply a kind of a normative talk. He said, listen, I recognize that there are different places in the world. There are failed states and there are classical modern states. And this is us, Japan, and some others postmodern. How we are functioning? He said, we cannot have the same approach everywhere. So we start with the assumptions that double standards are going to be there. The way we're dealing, for example, between each other is not the same way we're going to deal with countries like India or Russia, and of course, totally different than we're dealing with Somalia. At the same time, we're insisting on the idea of the international order. I do believe that what we perceived as a double standards, which were enforced on us by reality, perceived from outside, looked very much as the famous idea of the hypocrisy of the West. And this is quite important because I'm going to give you a kind of certain interpretation of the Russian policies, uh, which very much comes in the interest of this. When you talk to the Russians these days, uh, the most, first of all, this obsession with the hypocrisy of the West is they perceived it, is it right or wrong, it's totally different, but this is the talk. But what is the most interesting about the talk? So they start, for example, talking to Libya. And they said, did you see what you did? First, you lied to us about the safe heavens and you went for the regime change. But even this is not the worst. You went for the regime change and you produced chaos and migration and so on. Till now, everything is true. But the third point is very important. But you did it because, in fact, this is what you wanted. Because your basic strategy is of destabilization. Americans and Europe, as a part of it, is a declining hegemon. As a result of it, what you're interested in is simply destabilizing other parts and other competitors. Of course, I don't believe that this is what we or Americans wanted in Libya. I don't believe that any wanted to see what is happening. But because of the idea of the double standards perceived as hypocrisy, any type of a value talk now is perceived as a covered interest. As a result of it, any time when we said values, they read evil interests. We say revolution, they read covered operation. Strangely enough, as a result of it, they believe that in the 1990s, they have been imitating the wrong quest. Uh, uh, one of the most offensive words in the Russian policy world these days is naive. If I'm going to tell you that you are naive, this is even worse than you're stupid or betrayal or corrupt, because this is the bottom. And then don't want to be naive anymore. So what they're going to do? They're going to imitate the real West. The West they believe that basically they figured out as a result of all this. And as a result of it, for example, there are more than 100 books and pamphlets being written after the Orange Revolution on the idea of the color revolutions in Russia. 90% of them are talking about this as a covered operations. How you're mobilizing the street, what you're doing with the media, how you're using pressure here and there. Do you know what is the result of this reading of our actions? The result is what we're calling Russia's hybrid war. Because basically in their own misreading of the situations, they're sure that they're doing what we're doing. This is the problem with this. And this is the problem of how to reconcile the fact 
that you are staying in a world in which you want to be postmodern, you understand that the other are there, and you can play basically three different games. Here, of course, comes the problem how you're justifying your policies, because I don't believe that exists international order in which there is no double standards. I do believe it's nice to write about it, but if you're taking policy decisions, there are always going to be some double standards. And on the other side, what the Russians are offering, the idea of anti-hypocritical policy, is a policy based on crude power. So basically, taking Crimea is not hypocritical. It was kind of in your face. But the basic problem is that we are justifying interest-based policies on the value language, and we very much contributed to this confusion. Uh, and I do believe this is becoming a problem to the European Union. Uh, I was talking to a very uh, senior European diplomat who is doing a very, he was working uh, as a special envoy to a very special and troubled part of Africa. I said, how do you talk values there? For example, how do you talk human rights? And he said, listen, if I start with human rights, this is the end of the conversation because they do look at this as disrespect. Mm -hmm. So he said, if you want to achieve anything, and we're talking mainly about warlords, he said, we're talking like this. We're talking interest-based politics, and at the end of the conversation, I'm saying, and do you know what? We now have this nice deal, but there are these crazy constituencies in my countries which are obsessed with human rights, and if you're not going to give me something on human rights, I cannot go through with this. Give me something. Women, children, give me something. <laughs> uh, and he said, this was the only way to promote, and we're talking not about a cynical person, we're talking about a very, a really very skillful diplomat. He said, because for me, he said, the most important is to change something on the ground, because he said, I can give lectures and basically have a public talk about this, but how are you changing this? And then basically, they're giving something because they do believe it's a real politic. If I'm going and telling them I'm doing this because of your kids, which you are totally abusing, for your wives that you're basically abusing, uh, they're basically totally uh, reacting and saying we're not going to allow this. I do believe this is the new situation in which we're talking about, and this is a very difficult situation because this type of differences cannot be explained anymore in terms of democracies versus non-democracy. The sovereignty divide, especially on this, is much more difficult for us to deal with. And I do believe, of course, Russia is a case of its own, but you see Brazil, you see India, countries which basically people like, for example, Kagan were right, should automatically jump on the democratic camp and they are not doing this because when it comes to the idea of their view of the world and sovereignty, they are much more sharing Russia's or China's positions than the European Union one. Thank you. Would you like to add something, Peter? Oof, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe just briefly. I think, uh, Ben, you're, you're formulating to the three um, variations of the same theme, and that's the crisis of liberalism. You have the Cooper, you have the Judd, you have the, the relationship to the, to the past. And what the fundamental problem is, and it's very much what Ivan is saying too, I think, if I may permit myself, and it's that, the, that um, liberalism in the European version has become entirely or largely illiberal. So in order to maintain this sort of self-image that we like as Europeans, as liberal, as open to others, others other, other ideas, other religions, other races, etc. We have to clamp down on our institutions and, and make them work and, and use uh, illiberal uh, means. I mean, to take your Cooper example, we, the shock that Europe has had is that the rest of the world isn't Europe from a certain uh, point of view. Contrasted to the Americans who haven't realized yet that the rest of the world isn't America. <laughs> Uh, that naivety, that naivety has given, gave, have provided an immense power and uh, survival, uh, uh, cap capacity to, to survive, exactly, exactly that. It's this bad self-conscience, the European self-conscience that, uh, that, is, that is simply part of the problem. So you have this sort of internalization of this crisis of liberalism. It's not working out there. We're discovering that they're not liberal out there, and it's been internalized, and we're discovering we're not liberal in here, and that's where we see the specter of the past, of the illiberal, radically illiberal past. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I have uh, several more questions of my own, which I think is the right moment to, to uh, ask. The first, the first uh, for Peter again, 
a question related to what you said that the you know future and security, the present and insecurity, and it, as well at the same time you said that with the we we have witnessed an explosion of uh, security in many dimensions. So that in fact means that we what we are witnessing at the same time is an explosion of insecurity at the same time because they are always related. If I understand you correctly. Um, so, in fact, this is a vicious circle. The more we try to face the security, constructed security challenges in the future, the more insecure we feel. And this, my concrete question, then uh, relates to the neighborhood. So, if we cast our neighborhood in security terms and want to face the security challenges in the neighborhood, does it also lead to the increase of insecurity domestically and what can be done about that? Is it is it a process that simply cannot be stopped or is there a way in which we can face migration or the Ukrainian crisis uh, as challenges but perhaps not leading to the increase of insecurity domestically? And a similar question, perhaps a bit more specific to Ivan, about the neighborhood. Uh, in the past, both us and Russia perceived the neighborhood as a hybrid zone in between, you know, Balkanist theory, Stodorova, yes. this type of thinking. It is not really, as, as Ben said, not really us. It, they are on a transition to become European. And for Russians as well, they were not really, Ukraine was never really abroad in, in the strong sense of the word, but that kind of hybrid perception is disappearing clearly and they have to choose this is something again that is contained in our new foreign policy conception of the czech republic the stress that these countries have the right to choose but it basically implying that they have to choose either or black or white so so what 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 is the solution to that is is it is it a process that again cannot be stopped uh, uh, this choosing or the forcing them to choose and will it not lead in the case of Ukraine for instance to the breakdown of the societal consensus there and the final point uh, on migration for both of you again um, because of course this is the major major topic and, and the, the, the study Ben referred to by European values think tank uh, in fact the argument there uh, as I understand it, is uh, if we Europeanize the migration power, asylum and migration policies, then we will estrange the European publics to the European project even more, and the result will be the collapse of the European Union. So in sense, what they are saying is that we have to become illiberal externally to preserve the project domestically. I, I very uh, clearly see the problem with that, of course, because you know, this is kind of schizophrenic position there, but but that is the argument. So, what would you say to that argument? Because there is some truth to it that you face the danger of you know Pegida in Germany and uh, similar movements, UKIP in the United Kingdom, which play the note of of xenophobia and anti-migration uh, measures. Uh, Peter, would you like to start? Again, is it too very, many questions. No, I, no, they're just <laughs> two good, two good questions. That's the problem. Um, the, on the in, inflation of the, um, the security, the concept of security, it, I, I don't uh, share your view that it's it's a matter of a, a vicious circle. What I'm what I'm seeing there is simply an internalization of the security problem. So we're we become more and more nuanced and and sensitive to the ways in which we're insecure and it becomes more and more about us and less about them or the other mm -hmm. and the other or to put it philosophically the other becomes us we, we can become estranged to ourselves by 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 being uh, uh, insecure about our past about our feelings towards migrants or or others but i don't think that that exacerbates the situation it just makes it a, a a, a different one, that security becomes not a question of <coughs> keeping dangers out, but about managing it uh, here in our in our society. It becomes a societal uh, question, which then corresponds with the rise of the discourse of risk management, which corresponds to the, the rise of uncertainty and uh, precautionary politics. All these kinds of things are linked together with the fact that it's that it's right here. I mean, all the security issues in my life are in this room, be it Aryan flu, be it terrorism, be it 
the, the virus that's on my computer right there. Oh, no, is, is there? It's all right. It's all right here in this room. It's just a matter of how we can have a kind of social solidarity relationship that permits us to go on living together uh, under under those conditions. Mm. I mean, Yvonne may have a flu, and I'm sitting here shaking his hand, and, <laughs> and the one. You know, the next guy might be a terrorist. You could, it's, it's all right here. The threats are right here. So how can we maintain that, the social cohesion in, that, in the face of that? The question of the neighborhood policy then, or the neighborhood uh, writ large, um, the challenge here is not, the challenge here lies in the paradox of neighbors, that they're both us and they're not. They're welcome over any time except when they're not welcome over. Um, and this is the paradox which informs the neighborhood mm. program and policy. That is that um, we, jo we invite them to join, but they're, they're excluded mm -hmm. or they're yeah, un under a certain set of rules and, 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 and guidelines and regulations. So a true integration of the neighbor would in somehow erase or moderate the security threat. Uh, but keeping them out, keeping them as another outside, while calling them friends is somehow keeping that distrust uh, mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. Now, without even wanting it, you, or maybe by implicitly wanting it, you, this links to the, the, the question you asked about migration, too, because these are our friends. They're our brothers and sisters, aren't mm -hmm. they? Uh, and yet, they're not our brothers and mm -hmm. sisters, so they scare us. I find this, uh, I mean, I'm just hearing about this report from both of you to, today which uh, both shocks me and intrigues me, and I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's a plausible argument, I'm, I'm, I'm almost a little bit ashamed to say, that the European project in the sort of political superficial policy uh, perspective would be threatened mm -hmm. by better, more liberal integration, by more thorough realization of the European ethical project. Mm -hmm. So there are two different levels, I think, but nonetheless, I don't think I want to sacrifice the one for the other, so mm. I don't have the solution to this mm. problem. Mm. Mm. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Ivan. Thank you very much. Mm. Interesting question. I do believe that in order to understand what is going now, we should try to go back and try to see how we have been telling the story of the last 25 years. Mm. And we have been telling them the story of one project, the project mm. and the expansion of the European Union. So we didn't have neighbors in a proper sense. We have candidates for the EU. You go to these countries and basically you're telling what they're missing. They don't have rule of law, they don't have this and that. And this was part of the strengths of the EU because it was kind of the normative, the global idea. You believe that one day, you don't know the day, but you believe that one day and one way or the other, especially our neighbors are going to be part of us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we discovered uh, in the last 10 years, and Bulgaria contributed to this too in the Balkans, one important thing about the European soft power. It is a power to attract, but not always the power to transform. Everybody wants to join, but basically joining does not mean that in a certain way, basically, the transformation is over. Uh, and people start to talk about implementation, this and that, but obviously, Membership in the European Union or being part of the project does not make you uh, basically part of this European identity on the level of population, on the level of institutions. So I do believe that in order to understand what we should do, we should try to change the perspective and go back and try to discover something that in a certain way was obvious for everybody who was not living here. There were four different projects that were going on in Europe for the last 25 years. One, for sure was the transformation and the expansion of the European Union, and I do believe this was the most important project. On the other side, there was basically a state project in Russia and an attempt to uh, create a post-imperial Russian state, which unfortunately didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly there was a major problem in Turkey. Basically, you have the building of a post kemalist Turkey, which was totally a new project too. With a tri this is a different political identity. All of them are very new. All of them are 25 years old. Post-Maastricht EU post-imperial Russia, post kemalist Turkey, plus you have a dozens, more than dozens new states that have been created in the last 25 years. You don't have such an intensity of a state building in any part of the world with the exception of the Africa in the 1960s. 
you have the countries that came out of Soviet Union, the countries that came out of Yugoslavia. I don't believe that the Czech and Slovak are the great example. And these state building projects has a lot of different logics, but also different normative constraints. If you're looking at the Baltics and the Balkans, you're going to be surprised that they're part of the same type of a space and the major players have been the same. In the Balkans, major idea to include the minorities to the extent that basically anybody who has not asked to be a minority was not recognized for one. Very complicated constitutions, very complicated electoral processes, a different level of government, go to Bosnia, go to Kosovo. In the case of the Baltics, quite classical state building, very much based also on the exclusion of certain part of the population, the non-citizens uh, uh, and so on. So these state building projects go on, but in some countries, these state building resources were not very much there. In some of the Central Asian countries, when they basically ended out of the Soviet Union, they only have borders and names. And they should develop something. What they have been developing, we're not simply talking about ambiguity. Basically, most of these states, Ukraine and others, they have the mentality of the Cold War Tito. Basically, they have been using the Russia and the European Union as a sources for their identity building projects. So, in a certain way, they were neither at this moment pro-European or pro-Russian, mm -hmm. but basically they were trying to use everything in order basically to build a state playing with this or the other, and this is how they have been functioning. Uh, this was possible till the moment in which Russia was perceiving itself probably in a big future as part of the European space. This has started to change in the last 10 years for many and different reasons. Russian the domestic political identity started to change. And then at the moment when the Eurasian Union came and the European Union, from this point of view, I'm not buying the argument that it was the Eastern partnership that basically polarized uh, uh, the post-Soviet space. Listen, at the moment when you have two integration projects, polarization is there. You can be critical of how this or that was realized, but the logic was there. Because basically, the Russia saw itself as the center of a totally different integration project. Basically, this is where they were going. And then the countries were forced to choose. Here comes our problem, and here comes Russia's problem. Uh, Russia basically believes that it had nothing to choose because they know that they're part of their sphere of influence. And this is really difficult for them to understand why somebody should discuss Ukraine in general. We also have a problem. If we want to have the right to recognize the will of countries like Ukraine or Moldova or Georgia to join the European Union, we should be ready to recognize that somebody else probably wants to join something else. Be Belarus or Kazakhstan or Armenia. But here comes our normative problem. Do we believe that authoritarian states could be allowed to make these choices? And then, here's the paradox. We believe that only those who choose us has the right to choose. This is on the logical level, but this is unfortunately true. Mm -hmm. So this is why, for example, I have been strongly insisting on the fact that this is Russia's insistence on the Eurasian Economic Union that gives us a very strong legitimacy to claim if you want to have an integration project of your own, respect the decision of the Ukrainians, Moldovans, and Georgians to join others. Uh, because then, basically, this is about a sovereign choice. Probably we're not happy where Armenians go or Kazakhstan go. We live with our unhappiness. You should try to learn to live with your unhappiness too. But this is a major change from the perspective of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is a major change because this also means that what we do expect is Russia itself. Before and even now, we have a very strong idea that uh, the problem with Russia is called Putin. Putin is out and we are back to the 1990s. Uh, this is not exactly my, uh, uh, my reading, and not because of the cultural spheres. Uh, I'm Bulgarian, I'm the last one, basically. Uh, if Bulgarians can be in the EU, the Russians can be too. <laughs> so from this point of view, there is, nothing, uh, 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 there is nothing on this level. But the problem is, and here is one fact for you before going to a very difficult immigration project. Uh, now when you have this huge support for Crimea and when you have huge support for Putin, uh, people are saying what happened with those that have been anti-Putin, uh, basically, publics that have been so strongly in the, the December 2011, February, uh, uh, 2012 against Putin. Let's give you some empirical statistics. Support for Crimea was highest 
in some of the urban centers that have been most active in protesting against Putin. Because in a certain way, there is an identity building, and he came and told them, here is the meaning. So from this point of view, we should be ready to live with a Russia which is going to have an identity which is different in its nature. And then this problem of, is we have a different logic of the identity buildings and how these four different identity building projects are going to exist, coexist is becoming at the core of the European uh, project. And then comes the problem with the immigration. Uh, strangely enough, we're now ending up from the point of view of the general public with the fact, and this is very well articulated by all far-right populist and extreme parties, there are only two true Europeans, European elites and immigrants. They are Europeans. They are part of this European project. All others have certain national identities. <laughs> so when we are saying that you are going to integrate <laughs> immigrants, exactly in what? When they are coming, for example, to Bulgaria, are we trying to integrate them in the Bulgarian political national community where they can vote and do things and try to do it? Are we going to integrate them in an abstract, uh, uh, basically European space? Uh, and I do believe that strangely enough, uh, probably here's the paradox, to a strange extent the renationalization of certain politics can give much more flesh to the European identity and the European project because there is no return back to the nation state. Uh, the idea that European Union is disappearing and we're going back to the nation state, where to go? Where is Bulgarian nation state in this global world? But I do believe that to insist that Europeanization means at all level Europeanization of all policies is also logical, but in my view, politically unsustainable. This is, I really do believe from this point of view, probably with different logic than your colleagues, that yes, Bulgaria should try to integrate all these refugees in the Bulgarian society. And if they manage to do it better or worse, this is the way basically the integration in Europe is going to, to function. So from this point of view, to make a more general point, it's not about security anymore, it's about managing insecurity. Uh, and managing insecurity is what is happening in the way our democracy so much more about managing mistrust than creating trust these days. So this is what we are not ready to do. Uh, and from this point of view, I very much agree that all the external problems that we have are immediately translated into internal problems. In France, you say Putin and you mean Marie Le Pen. Uh, so this is, this is where I, uh, I, I do believe the situation has changed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just for anyone who's interested, you're, you can read a reply uh, to the European Values case on this from our Centre for European Security in uh, Czech on the Respect website from tomorrow and in English on the Visegrad Inside website uh, from Thursday. So an alternative view also from Central Europe. A little bit of PR for, for Centre. Uh, one, one last round of questions, so please, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Libor Sneisko and I'm from Center for Security Policy of the Charles University. I have a particular question on the issue of so-called European Army. Uh, that's something which might, uh, there is no clear uh, notion, no, no clear definition. Uh, it might, it might uh, have a very diverse contents, uh, but still I would like to know what you see as its or if you see any potential in it, what, what is possible and what is impossible. And then a sub-question, uh, whether, for example, uh, the action from the US, it's, it's uh, possible uh, withdrawal of its military from Europe cannot be an impetus for, for uh, forming of the European <coughs> Armed Forces. And the uh, second one, um, we know that uh, identity of an entity is, is formed in, uh, when you face something different. So it so, uh, cannot be... Uh, having the the European army which can, which is oriented outward which can be demonstrated or uh, deployed in the outer world cannot it uh, happen to, to support or to boost the European identity instead of uh, muddling through our internal problems and difficulties that's mm -hmm. the question thank you thank you any more questions or comments Daniela one more Yes, I just have a quick comment that I wanted to say that you're absolutely right that the underlying theme, I also think, is the European identity that without another, basically the European project is hollow, that the, the values, the norms that Ian Manus was, was talking about in his case study on human rights, 
we tend to stress human rights when it comes to some, but not when it comes to others. For example, relations with big players such as the US or the Chinese. That the values on which we base, we base our European project, democracy, rule of law, that they don't really necessarily apply to the EU itself. Uh, the democratic legitimacy deficit or the fiscal compact rules when the Greeks, they change their governments, yet they still have to continue doing projects. So, you know, what, what Europe will remain there if, the, if, if we kind of change and kind of integrate the others? If we think about the migrants as, uh, yes, we should, be, um, we, should, we should uphold our values of being humanitarian, the, the human rights, and every, treat everybody equal, include them, then it, would, it should upheld the European project as it was based from within, but then we, we, we would lose the other. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't have a ready answer, and I do think that treating migrants or minorities as second class citizens, it's, it's ultimately wrong, and it's not what mm -hmm. I would want for, but mm -hmm. uh, I see this huge dilemma in here that once we lose the others, then we will be ultimately losing ourselves because you're right to say that we have European elites, but the population, I don't think uh, we really, I don't think the population really feels European or that they would want to um, bind themselves to, to the European project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, ben? Just perhaps a provocation to get people thinking a little, for, to take things to take further on. Um, this values interests, uh, this thing that we've been making, and can one support the other or not? The attempt to combine these in the European neighborhood policy, to move essentially from ring of friends to friends with benefits, in order to sell this to a skeptical European population, seems to have bedeviled this policy. The two logics are quite different, this logic of interest and logic of values. Um, so can, can we think of a productive way to actually combine those at a European level, or are they necessarily contradictory? I would add to the previous question as well, but perhaps a bit more general question. Do you, when talking about identity, this is of course, this position is very much widespread in IR studies and social constructivism, you would always have the other against which, one single other against which you construct your own identity. But of course there are many other possibilities. You have social identity theory, typhal, with multiple identities, you have dialogical constructions of identity, Habermasian type, we talked about before, and, and many other examples in, in philosophy as well. So what, what is your approach to uh, EU identity building? Do you believe that we truly need another against which, in a, perhaps even in a negative sense, we construe ourselves, or is it not necessary? Um, Peter, would you start? I mean, all these, the three questions actually go together, so I could maybe tackle them all. Uh, and yours answers yours, so maybe they cancel each other. You can talk to each other. They each other. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you put your finger right on the, <coughs> the Voltairean uh, paradox of uh, toleration. We tolerate mm -hmm. everything, and, and suddenly everything is Europe, and then Europe doesn't exist mm -hmm. anymore. The whole and then you have to get interstellar, and then you have the other planets, which are the other... <laughs> Martians. Martians. <laughs> Or alternatively, there's one European and everything else is other. Or it's the grave of Robert Schumann or, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just the paradox. I'll come back to the solution <coughs> which links to yours. Um, yes, a European army uh, out there duking it out with the evil other would form identity. It's not going to happen because nobody was willing to die for Europe. Uh, so the logic is right, but the ethos is wrong, uh, I think. And the, the kind of identity that you're um, looking for, Peter, is, um, is, is one which we're not very good at as human beings, and namely the, the, you said schizophrenic, that's a bit strong, but uh, paradoxical or uh, operatic, that is that we're both ourselves and others, or that we're, we're ourselves and dependent on others. If you don't see me, you know, the recognition model, the Hegelian model, I need the other to see me and recognize me as a person in order to be myself. Therefore, I'm not completely myself without that other, and that, so that it's other is me. And that, I mean, just in pragmatics, that doesn't work in, in voting democratic institutions. I have to go in the booth alone and vote, and, uh, and I can't have the other with me. And so there's a kind of paradox of, of living in society. But I think the solution has to be that we accept this paradox. Mm -hmm. 
that we're not entirely ourselves, even though the basics of civil life depend on having an identity card and a democratic vote and all that. Individual. Yeah. Living with the paradox. Yeah, let's also go, because I do believe it's the same question. We can have a European army. It's going to be professionals. There was here an opinion that nobody is going to die defending Europe. Here's the result of the Gallup December 2014 polls. Are you ready to defend your own country? 29% of the French said yes. 27% of the Brits, and we're talking about France and Britain, not for the European Union. 18% of the Germans, and 68% of the Italians said that they will not go to defend their country. So from this point of view, this is also the paradox of Europeanization. Uh, we manage basically to believe that we are Europeans to the extent that we are not going to fight the war and to defend ourselves. Uh, from this point of view, Robert Gates was very good at this. He said what was the major success in, because he made of this demilitarization of the culture of Europe could become a security problem for Europe because it's part of the identity of the Europeans. We are not fighting anymore, even for our state. So you can have a common army. It's going to be an army not of citizens. It's going to be European drones, mercenary. They could be Pakistanis that we can rent. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, this is not going to create identity. Because the identity are creating citizen soldier. And I cannot see citizen soldier being the, this type of a uh, do. But then comes the problem of the other. Uh, there were two big kind of experiments to create this in a political term. Do you remember 2003, Derrida and Habermas, Iraqi war, people on the streets, America is the big other, we're going to create identity. It didn't work. There were people who now with uh, the crisis with the Russia believe the same. Mm. It's not working for different reasons. And this is the problem is America in a certain way, mm. yes, but too close. In the case of the Russia, Soviet Union was another on the basis of which you can make an identity because Soviet Union was a universal project. Russia is an enemy. You can basically deal with it militarily, politically, and so on. But strangely enough, uh, they can subverse, but nobody is afraid that they're giving a model that is going to transform and give different Europe. Because when the Russians start to talk conservative traditional values, it's becoming slightly a joke if you know that this is the country with the highest percent of abortions in the world mm. per person. Uh, the same basically go with divorces. And when they start attacking capitalism, you probably remember that they have a higher inequality than the United States. So from this point of view, in order to have an other that is helping you to have a political and social identity, this other should have a consistency of its own. And this is why I do believe that uh, uh, this is part of the story. We are looking for somebody that could play the role the Soviet Union play. Unfortunately, Russia cannot do it, which does not mean that there is no problem concerning what Russia is doing on our borders, but it's a different type of a problem which is going to be dealt totally differently. Uh, and I do believe this is, uh, this is part of the problem with this identity. Probably this identity is not going to be the same as the national identities that we used to have. It's going to be renegotiated, it's going to be forced. Uh, just to give you an idea what basically is the positive view of all this. I was reading a lot of public opinion polls recently. So here is the story that, if you know. Uh, many people believe, uh, for the polls, what is happening in Ukraine is direct threat to their security. Full stop. Basically, they do believe that the situation can turn back and what was happened to them in the last 25 years could be reversed. So many people believe that because of this, Poles support arming of the Ukrainians and uh, opening the border, borders uh, for visa regime for the Ukrainians. It's not true. Exactly because it's a major security threat. They don't support arming the Ukrainians and they're afraid of a refugee flow, so basically even more of them are against opening the borders. On the other side, Bulgarians are buying a big stuff of what the Russians are talking about, the crisis in Ukraine. Bulgarians are like your president. They do believe that America is to be blamed for this and this and that. Does it mean that Bulgaria is going to veto sanction policy of the EU? No. Because also Bulgarians know that at the end of the day, disintegration of the European Union is the major threat to our security, and also that Russia is not model for anybody, even for itself. So from this point of view, I do believe that, strangely enough, the strength of the European Union is going through this type of a exhaustion of a strong political alternatives that are generated in this political space. How strong it is going to be, is it enough? 
But this type of a weak identity, in my view, is the only identity that we can have. Uh, and from time to time, the strong identity, like, by the way, was the Soviet identity built in a war in which they had been dying, 20 million for defending the country, it appeared it's not enough to defend the Soviet Union when basically the Soviet Union was uh, under pressure. So probably also we should try to love weak identities and to try how to make a strategic sense out of them. Right, so thank you very much for the positive ending. That's very important given the very bleak picture of the future. I would like to thank both our speakers. Please join me in thanking them. And now we'll have a short 15-minute break and let us meet again in uh, five minutes to four uh, in the hall there for the opening uh, of the Centre for European Security. So please do not leave, stay with us, let's meet in 15 minutes. Thank you. So you're going to be baptized. <laughs> <laughs>